Will inflation bring out the Fed hawks? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Maggie Lake. With me today is Mike Alfred, founder and managing partner at Alpine Fox LP. Hi, Mike. It's great to have you back on the Daily Briefing. Thank you, Maggie. It's always good to be here. So you're on our platform often. It's been a little while since you've been on the Daily Briefing with us. So just as a refresher to kick us off, um, just sort of talk about your approach, what you focus on, and sort of the time frame you're usually operating in. Sure. Yeah. So I have a, a hedge fund called Alpine Fox LP, but that's really just one of the things that I do. I invest my own money in private companies as well. I sit on boards, I'm pretty active, engaged investor on the governance side, um, including serving on the board of Iris Energy, which is a NASDAQ listed uh, Bitcoin miner, tickers IREN, and actually they just changed their, their name. But in the fund, I'm really focused on long duration value investing ideas uh, with a focus on like real point to point investing. So I don't really care so much about what happens in a month or in a quarter. I'm more interested on what happens across two or three years mm. before resetting. Um, and so historically, I've covered healthcare, uh, energy, staples, traditional tech, you know, pretty much uh, any sector that matters. Um, but for the next year and a half or two years or so, I think Bitcoin and, and the sort of the crypto ecosystem. Uh, with a particular focus on infrastructure providers, I think is the probably one of the best risk-adjusted opportunities on the planet. So I'm spending a lot of time there, but of course, also eyeing out of the corner of my eye how cheap healthcare stocks look and <laughs> what's happening in the energy complex, et cetera. That's awesome. We'll unpack all of that. Um, but I love that because it's, I mean, we first of all, we're in a situation where I think there is a lot of conversation about whether the longer term trends are changing. You know, are we in tra in transition to a higher inflationary, higher rate environment? Um, are things shifting globally in terms of deglobalization? So there's a lot of big macro trends that I feel like everyone's paying attention to right now. And there's a lot of debate and division over. Um, and then the fact that you look across crypto and digital assets is fantastic as well, I think, for this audience, because everyone's at the point where whether you're sophisticated and you've been in the space or you're new to it, and now there's an ETF and a, and a way to access it if you weren't able to before, where people are looking at this and looking at things against the macro backdrop and saying, what do I need to do? Should this be in my portfolio? Should this be something that I am looking at or I am educating myself more on it? So you're at a great cross-section, I think, for us right now. So let's um, let's let's start on on maybe the macro backdrop first. And we have all of this inflation data coming out this week. It's going to be a really important week uh, to get a gauge on where we are. And it looks like rates, everyone's focused on rates again. We've seen the treasury yields back up as the market's sort of rethinking the Fed. What are you expecting on that front? So you got to unpack a, a lot of things there. I mean, obviously, back in October of the last year, we were at 5% on the 10 year. And there are a lot of people that were way overly bearish at that point. I was not one of them. You go back and look at my tweets. I thought people got too negative sort of right at the, right at the bottom. And I kind of said, look, like, like the yields are going to back off here, right? There's a lot of reasons for, for why that should happen. Um, but since then, you know, we, we basically bottomed out, I think it was like 3.8% or so mm. um, in December. And we've been rising all the way through this year, while the S and P is going up, while Bitcoin is going up, while a lot of risk assets are going up, um, and I think what that says is that like rates are are still not too high, um, and so I, I don't, I, I'm not really that concerned to be honest. Like I think in general, inflation has sort of come down quite a bit from from the peaks. I don't see major spikes outside of like uh, you know very short term oriented things like a geopolitical. A problem in the Middle East leading to a spike in oil prices for short periods of time. It seems to me that enough of the U.S. economy, for example, is slowing down at this point that inflation is more or less under control. And I think the bigger picture issues right now are the fiscal issues in the U.S., right? So the, the size of the, the debt, the, the national debt, the size of the deficits, right? The amount of money that was sort of pumped into the economy previously. I think there's a lot of focus on the Fed um, and, and maybe rightfully so. And, and I guess if that's what you do for a living, I guess you can, can do that. Um, but I'm not sure that's what's actually driving the action. Um, so uh, inflation, I think it'll probably not be that surprising. It'll probably be um, you know, down year over year, right? But, but probably um, you know, surprise some people to the upside. And there'll be uh, certain people in the Fed who say, look, we should keep rates higher for longer. Maybe we should do fewer cuts. There'll be some people that don't say that. 
Um, but I still think they're going to end up cutting at some point between now and the end of July, uh, simply because they're kind of locked into that by the the election cycle, the previous signaling, what the market believes. Um, and so there's kind of two things about the Fed that I I don't believe. One is that they actually know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and the second one is that they're not a political organization, right? I mm-hmm. actually think they are. And the more they tell me they're not, the, the less I believe them. Um, so I think I think rates are coming down. I think the good news, though, is if rates don't come down until, say, July or August, September timeframe, we probably have another good year uh, for most risk assets out in front of us. And I think, you know, there's some positives there. So when you're talking about the fiscal and and just to that point, you have headlines today, um, you know, uh, Biden's new sto- student loan forgiveness plan could erase 20 million. So, so, you know, there's talk on that again. I mean, listen, talk is talk is we know that it's a quagmire getting anything done in Washington, especially in an election year. It's very unlikely things get done or, or if they do, it gets tested and overturned. But just from a headline point of view, to speak to that fiscal sentiment you're talking about, there's also talk about the CHIPS Act, you know, who, who gets what factories are getting help. So you're still seeing that all move to the pipeline. What What is the impact of that from your perspective when you're looking at what kind of investments or how that hits markets? What part of that are you watching? I mean, I, I think at the highest possible level, my, my fundamental bets right now are that politicians will not stop intervening in markets, right? Like if I, if I want to be really simple and straightforward, right? I don't think they'll stop uh, printing money when it suits them. I don't think they'll stop running deficits when it suits them. I don't think they'll stop being profligate in general. Um, and I think that benefits any ideas that that can take advantage of kind of a cheaper money, high liquidity environment um, that we're in. And look, last year, Bitcoin was up 100 and some 56%. The S&P was up like 24%. Um, mm-hmm. So about 6x uh, more than the S&P. Um, so far year to date, spot on. S&P's up right around 10%. Bitcoin's up right around 60%. Um, I expect that sort of dynamic to continue where uh, unless unless the politicians change their mind and, and adopt austerity all of a sudden and they direct, you know, Janet Yellen calls uh, Jerome Powell into her office and says, hey, you know, we, we really want you to keep rates higher and we want you to raise them. Um, that would be the one thing that could actually slow this down. But the odds of that happening in this environment when the Fed has, uh, when the Treasury has a lot of debt uh, to refinance, like it's much more likely that Yellen's calling uh, Jerome Powell and saying, "Look, um, we need you to bring the rates down uh, by the midpoint of this year, simply because we can't have, uh, you know, poor and middle class people struggling um, in this environment. We can't have unemployment go up too much, right? So there's all these, yeah, they they say they're looking at inflation, and that's like one of their fundamental parts of their mandate. But the reality is they're going to tolerate." higher inflation, in my opinion, if, if it means it keeps the existing set of politicians in office. So I may be uh, too skeptical, right? But but I just don't, I'm not sure a lot of this stuff matters. I think it's ultimately noise. So when you expect something like Bitcoin, and we'll, you know, we'll get a little bit more into what parts of that market you find most attractive, but when, when you think that'll benefit, that backdrop will benefit something like Bitcoin, are you saying that risk assets will benefit that's just supercharged or are you more on the you know it's a hedge hedge against fiat devaluation type of type of situation exponential gold if you will yeah so, so maybe a little bit of both but also neither um i, I view it a, a little bit differently i kind of view it more as a defensive asset in a world where almost everything can be printed everything can be debased um, the politicians and the Fed and the ECB and the Japanese Central Bank, like they can't change the monetary policy of, of Bitcoin. And so it kind of uh, fights back against this sort of infinite printing idea, this modern monetary theory type of approach that everybody seems to have embraced as, as something that can go on forever. Like there seems to be a generally pervasive view amongst policymakers and, and others globally, like the, the Illuminati, that you can sort of print money forever. Um, and that that will lead to sort of infinite growth without any uh, drawbacks. Um, and I'm just I'm just not sure that that's the case. And I think it, rather than calling it a hedge, I just call it a defensive exposure. That's sort of the antidote to the prevailing view that that everything that's happening sort of around the world right now makes sense and should continue um, as is. That said, you know, obviously when there's a ton of liquidity, that liquidity needs to find a home. It's finding a home right now in homes. Right, that the real estate market, in spite of six, seven, eight percent mortgage rates, is continuing 
to do very well, particularly in the West, right? So California, Nevada, et cetera, like they're on fire. I mean, I'm, I just look at some of the data and I can't believe it. I would have thought if rates went from 3%, uh, 3.5% on the 30 year to 6.5%, there would be a slowdown. And that's not at all um, what I'm seeing. So people are still buying homes. People are still buying stocks, right? People are still out spending money, travel, trips, food. I went out to this walkable promenade, uh, no joke, by my house this weekend. And it was busier than I've ever seen it. You couldn't get a parking spot, re- lines around the block. I get that people could say that that's exactly what happened before the 2008 crisis. I get that. Um, but we do not have you know, strippers with 12 homes um, this cycle. So it's not being driven by the same factors as before. So, so I just look, at, I look around, I think anecdotally, pretty obvious to me that we're not in the midst of a very large uh, slowdown. And so it, it didn't really make sense for the last two or three years for them to keep rates low as long as they did um, and to run deficits as high as they did and to basically give the fiscal stimulus at the size that they did since the pandemic. I think that was an over-response. I think it was politically driven. Uh, I think we're still trying to digest that, that excess liquidity. So that, I think it will end up, a lot of that will end up in Bitcoin. It'll end up in stocks, it'll end up in real estate. I just think Bitcoin, because it also has a technology S-curve for adoption, it's newer it's less understood and it's, it's more misunderstood. It's more of a contrarian, non-consensus type of opportunity. It has more upside, right? Like everybody knows real estate's a good asset. So like, I'm not saying anything new there. Yeah, that's an interesting way, interesting way to put it. I want, I want to, um, Kevin Kelly and Raul sat down for their monthly um, insider talks, pro, in, pro crypto insider talks on our platform. And they were talking about Bitcoin this cycle. Let's play a clip from that and then we'll talk on the other side. We're just in the middle of the run, right? Normally, there's a pause around the all-time high, so Bitcoin's doing that. Um, We've had, we'll talk a bit about, you know, what's been going on in memes and all the other stuff in a bit. But generally speaking, it's kind of steady as she goes. This, you know, we've got a bit of correction. We get through whether it's before the halving, after the halving, in the next week or who knows, we'll start to see accelerated price action again. The next phase will be, my view is the next phase is Bitcoin 100,000 um, and the uh, others going through their all-time highs. And that's when it sets off the silly season I call the banana zone. So it's, just all, it's all ahead. It's just a patience game. I and mean, so, we're all so impatient because you kind of know where it's going. You're just waiting for it to happen. It just takes bloody forever and then it all gets crazy. And you can see that whole interview, uh, the March edition of their monthly chat on the platform. Uh, if you are not a member or not a pro crypto member, um, do so now. A lot of good alpha in there. Uh, so, Mike, um, what what are your thoughts, or, or how are you thinking about this cycle? Because we know, and there are plenty. There are some people probably listening to this where like they saw what happened last time. In fact, Deutsche Bank had a really interesting poll. I think I saw this on Reuters where. More than half of the people they polled believe that cryptocurrencies are now an important asset class. So that sort of skepticism, this is a bunch of, you know, ridiculous, whatever, um, that seems to have gone away. And they're like, no, this is this is the real deal. This is around to stay. But a third of them expected Bitcoin to drop to 20,000. That's a pretty big decline from here. So th- I think there's there is sort of less skepticism, but still a lot of fear about what these cycles look like. So what are your thoughts about what's happening this time around? Oh, it's a really good setup, I think. Um, two things. One is that Bitcoin dropped below its previous all-time cycle high um, for the first time in history. And then secondly, very recently, Bitcoin went above uh, its previous all-time high pre-halving, which has never happened before. So we're seeing like an expansion of of the ranges in which which Bitcoin moves. I, I largely view like the move from sixteen to seventy as just a rebasing um, at a new fundamental level. So I, I personally don't think the bull market, like the real meat of the bull market, has even started yet. Historically, you start to see significant movement within a few months, three to six months post having. We, we've got having the having coming up in a couple weeks here. Um, and I think uh, at that point is where you really start the clock for the bull market. My personal expectation is that the peak of the bull market won't actually happen until at least the middle of 2025. I think statistically that's where you should be looking for between kind of the middle of next year and the end of next year. I think there's a small chance that we peak early because of the ETF 
demand kind of pulling forward some of the demand for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a small chance that the peak isn't until 2026 for the same reason, um, because the structural demand dynamics have shifted in, 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 with the lower supply that you have post having. Um, so I think we're more in the second or third inning um, at, at max. Um, I don't think we're middle innings yet. I think I'll probably be looking for that kind of vibe in the mid to late uh, summer. Like that's when I think we'll start to know for sure what kind of cycle we're dealing with. Um, and I again, I would separate Bitcoin from crypto. I would tend to agree with people who think most of crypto is still not investable. It's not institutional grade. It's not something you have to have in your portfolio. I think it's largely speculation. I think Bitcoin gets lumped in um, with a lot of that stuff. Um, and it gets lumped in also with things like meme stocks um, that also, in my view, have little kind of long-term fundamental value. Um, and Bitcoin's quite unique uh, because it is uh, backed by real-world energy, right, and infrastructure and data centers. And one thing I'd call out that I think is really important is that the Bitcoin data center business has largely started to converge with the AI data center business, a business that Sam Altman at, at uh, OpenAI and, and Elon Musk and others are now saying is going to want to be one of the most scarce commodities in the world. I tend to agree with that. I think compute in general is going to be one of the most scarce commodities in the world over the next five years. And compute is largely fungible. So if you build a large-scale data center and you plug into the grid and you have a lot of power, you could plug in NVIDIA chips and you're an AI data center. You could plug in uh, Bitcoin miners from Bitmain, now you're a Bitcoin facility, or you could split it and do 50-50 or 80-20. And so I think a lot of people aren't looking at this the right way. Like the real shortage um, in the broader kind of Bitcoin ecosystem is in infrastructure, right? It's it's the infrastructure, the real world infrastructure that actually makes these technologies scale. And I, and I think AI is actually helpful because a lot of traditional investors understand AI and it's a largely consensus trade. Like you won't find a good investor anywhere in the world, even value investors, who will argue AI is just hot air. They may tell you NVIDIA is overvalued and I, I would largely agree that it's probably fully valued, at least at this current price, but they'll never tell you that AI is not a thing at all. Uh, the difference between AI and Bitcoin is there's still a big chunk of traditional investors who think Bitcoin is total hot air, uh, but functionally they're backed by the same thing, which is large-scale compute. That is such that is such a fantastic point. So let me, let's break that down a little bit. Um, are, are you, so do you invest in, and I'm I'm thinking about how to word this because we have some folks who are super sophisticated and I'll we'll get to some of those questions who are who are in this space and have been investing in this space uh, and do it directly owning Bitcoin and Ethereum and Solana. And then we have people who do not have this in their portfolio at all and are still on the learning journey. So I want to make sure we take everybody along here. Do you, um, when you're looking at Bitcoin, believe investing in Bitcoin itself, which we know is not impossible but not super easy for everyone or do you think through the etf is fine uh so i've i've advised a lot of people on this exact question um including very recently and i think it depends a bit on your level of technology sophistication mm -hmm. right so if you're a 80 year old real estate investor who's made tens of millions of dollars in real estate but really doesn't like to use your laptop even then you're probably never going to self-custody your bitcoin Right. And there's a good chance if you buy it in Coinbase, you're going to get hacked. You're going to you're going to lose your account. You're going to lose access, et cetera. And so for those types of people, just buying the BlackRock or Bitwise ETF, right, in your brokerage account is actually the lowest risk thing, right? And there's different dimensions of risk. The primary risk for an individual is that you lose access to your to your holdings, right? Because these are bearer assets. They're not like stock certificates. It's not like a bank account or a credit card or anything like that. If somebody gets access to your assets or control over your account, you have no longer have control over those assets, and you will yeah. you will lose them. Um, and so I think those old bear bonds. Remember those? Yeah, <laughs> they used to yeah. sell in the you know. <laughs> they're, they're digital bear assets, and so for my kind of risk frameworks, I think for most people, buying the ETF in their brokerage account is actually going to be the most accessible and safest way. If you want to follow kind of some of the fundamental principles of Bitcoin and unbank yourself and have no counterparty and sort of be able to go off the grid, well, then, of course, you need to learn about, uh, you know, cold storage, self-custody. Uh, but that requires a bit more sophistication than a lot of the uh, people deep in the industry would would like to admit. Um, and yeah. so I think the ETFs do enable uh, quite a bit of additional uh, money flow from from less sophisticated folks who know they need exposure. They, they understand at a very high level that there's something here. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but they've historically not wanted to take the risk of, of owning it directly. And I think that's fine. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And um, we have, um, for those of you who do want to try to figure it out and play around with, even if it's splitting it up a little bit, um, we've got an, we've got the Crypto Academy. We've got another session dropping on that to sort of walk you through what to do, because it isn't that easy. Uh, what about the, the thing you mentioned now about compute power being scarce? So is that your favorite way of playing this? And, and and is that what you're talking about if people are saying, oh, buy the miners or the miners that people are dealing with compute power? Or is that a completely separate group where you're really doing more of that infrastructure play, as you say, that can swing either way? What does that look like? Is that the area you favor? Because it seems like that would be a way to play the Bitcoin potential you see without having to go through buying Bitcoin itself, or maybe not. It absolutely is, but it's an advanced way of doing it, and it won't always work for everybody in, in every situation, right? And so at the very outset, I would just say, if your desire is to have exposure to Bitcoin, the cleanest way to do that is just buy Bitcoin or buy the ETF, uh, because every other uh, attempt to outrun Bitcoin is is potentially going to introduce new risks that most investors uh, candidly are not equipped to deal with. As in a more advanced investor, Again, somebody who's highly engaged, I'm on the board of, of one of these data center developers, right? I, I was on the board uh, the month before they went public. I've participated in all of the strategic and capital raising exercises with them. I've seen them build the team. I've seen them acquire the sites, right? So I go really deep into the details of, of what actually um, helps these companies be successful. And for someone like me, what I'm looking for is some sort of multiple of return on the Bitcoin return. And the way to think about this really uh, simply is that um, these businesses operate on on margins, right? So, if if you have a, a cost of power and all in cost of, per Bitcoin to produce a new Bitcoin, that's like say thirty thousand dollars all in, and the Bitcoin price is sixty thousand. Well, you're a fifty percent gross margin business. That's an okay margin, and the stock will trade at whatever it trades at. But what tends to happen every cycle is the price of Bitcoin goes parabolic, but the cost to produce Bitcoin as an infrastructure provider stays somewhat fixed. So let's just say hypothetically, Bitcoin goes to 150,000 um, and your cost of mine is still 30,000. Well, now all of a sudden you're what? An 80% mm -hmm. gross margin business and, and, and so, so on and so forth, right? As the price goes higher. And so what happens is the market tends to mark these equities up because they get tremendous operating leverage at higher and higher Bitcoin prices. And so historically through a full cycle, let's say Bitcoin 3Xs or 5Xs from, from trough to peak, oftentimes the miners will do some multiple of that. They'll be up 10X, 20X, 30X. Again, with a lot of lags, uh, with a lot of volatility and with a lot of unpredictable outcomes, which is why you need to be really smart. And so I don't, like my mom doesn't own Bitcoin infrastructure stocks. Like my father-in-law doesn't own these. They just own straight Bitcoin as they have for many, many years um, at my direction. But but um, I personally have large positions in the miners because I also own and had on for many years spot Bitcoin. I, I own the ETFs, right? So I kind of want to own everything. I think this is the part of the cycle. If you really understand what's happening, like for the next 18 months where you want to own Bitcoin, you want to own Ethereum, you want to own the Bitcoin ETFs, you want to own MicroStrategy, you want to own Coinbase, you want to own the miners, and you want to own all of them in size. You don't, you don't really need to get too cute. What I see some people doing that looks smart, but I think is actually going to be sort of penny wise, pound foolish, is trying to do these really cute pair trades where they're short one thing and long the other and long one thing and short the other. Um, and this part of the cycle, you tend to get blown up doing that because they all go up, right? They all go up together. The question is just to what degree? Uh, we have a question because um, you brought up Ethereum uh, that, so I think it's fair to say that People, again, who are newer and thinking about this from an asset allocation point of view, they know Bitcoin, they know Ethereum. That was the other one that's really popular and increasingly Solana because it did so well last year. And also, mm -hmm. full disclosure, it was one of Ralph's favorite picks and he got it really right. And so we've heard a lot about it. Um, Ralph saying, I I'm hearing a ton of bearishness around Ethereum. What's your view? And are there any other protocols that are interesting to him? So I think it's worth saying when we talk about coins, very often we're talking about protocols in the ecosystem as opposed to like the same way we would talk about fiat. It's different, right? Which is, I think, confusing to people. But what what is your thought about Ethereum? Well, I own a little bit and I've disclosed this on the record for for years. I think the, the most recent tranche that I bought, I bought at $300. So it's been like 11x uh, so far. I also 
have gone on the record uh, in Q4 of last year, and I accumulated about 250,000 shares of the Grayscale Ethereum Trust. I view that more as a special situation. It was trading at a 14 or 15 percent discount to the underlying spot, right? So I was more interested in the arbitrage. It's the same. It's effectively the same trade I did last year on GBTC. Something I came on. I think this show, not the daily briefing, but on on Real Vision as well as like Scott Melker's podcast and talked about at the beginning of last year, I said, look, there's a really good chance that the Bitcoin ETF gets approved. And if you can buy Bitcoin in the Bitcoin trust structure for 45% discount, you're likely to get the return of Bitcoin plus something, right? And that's what happened, right? Bitcoin is up 150%. And I think GPTC was up well over 250%, maybe more. Um, and so I think coming to this year, I thought, look, um, there's a chance the Ethereum ETF gets approved. But in the meantime, you can sort of ARB uh, that discount that you're getting on the Grayscale Ethereum Trust. Um, so that's what I did. Um, I took the opportunity when when ETHE is the ticker, it was up like 70, 80% very early this year. So I took the opportunity to trim that position down. I'm sort of neutral on Ethereum right now, but I would note that today, after this weekend, the Grayscale Ethereum Trust was up 17%. And all of a sudden, sort of midday, like the volume kind of picked up and you could see it running what that implies to me is somebody probably knows something about what's actually happening with the SEC's review of the ethereum applications like uh, Larry Fink did a uh, an interview recently where he he didn't express quite as much confidence uh, as he did about the bitcoin etf approval but he did sort of imply like we'll see what happens you know that sort of thing i would not be surprised if there's a lot of back channeling going on right now between a bunch of large asset managers in the SEC in regards to this uh, again, not making a call on what I think happens, but I think it's notable what happened today. Like if you look closely at the trading and ETHE, it, it implies to me that maybe uh, some some sort of insider knows what's going on. Very interesting. And if you and if if anyone's listening who has not yet taken um, or does not yet own Bitcoin or Ethereum, um, do you feel like it's early innings? Because I think because we've seen these big price moves, people and then. You know, there are lots of early adopters like yourself who've been sitting on it, who have these, you know, ridiculous gains already, regardless of what happens. And people think, oh, I missed it. Or, oh, it's, you know, it's it's swinging around and they're kind of not sure about the timing. Does it feel like it's fine to accumulate this at this point? Yeah. I mean, look, I I am still, right? I'm still adding. I was adding um, as recently as Friday to the to the Bitcoin ETFs, right? And, and they opened up uh, larger, uh, you know, up significantly this morning. Um, but but I'm looking out 12 or 18 months. Again, I still think we're second or third inning. I think MicroStrategy has priced in like quite a bit of uh, growth. Right, the MicroStrategy is probably like one of the most obvious levered ways to play Bitcoin. It's had a very good year year to date. It's definitely trading into premium. It's underlying Bitcoin. But but just buying spot Bitcoin to me again is the is the safest and cleanest way to get the exposure. The the miners are actually. Um, more highly levered, especially as you look later out in the cycle, because what happens is the cost of production diverges more from the price as the price starts to go parabolic. And that's when those equities really sort of take off. And so I could I could make a good argument that actually on a Bitcoin terms, the miners are actually quite cheap, even relative to Bitcoin, relative to MicroStrategy, Coinbase, and some of the others. That's where I, you know, and I'm still doing this, right? Where I'm still applying a bit more size to some of these positions, I was literally still topping up this morning because I still think those names are some of the top names in that group are undervalued. So that's where I'm focused. Um, I, if I was putting a new dollar to work today and I didn't know anything at all, I would stick with Bitcoin. Uh, AJ asking to swing it back a little bit on the macro side. Um, do you expect funds to flow further out the risk curve to things like small caps? I don't think small caps are further out the risk curve right now on a on a relative valuation standpoint. So I'm not saying that smaller companies aren't less risky in a vacuum, right? Because obviously large companies have access to capital, right? They have a larger shareholder base. They, they have more diversified revenue oftentimes, et cetera. They're more well-known. But at the current valuation spread, I would view small caps as a value purchase with a better margin of safety. And I think that's actually what the market's saying over the last couple quarters, right? Where you're starting just under the surface to see a little bit of a rotation from these kind of mag seven large cap names the Teslas and Apples, where a lot of the air has kind of gone out of the balloon this year. Uh, and if you look at under the surface at some of these small cap funds, right? The, 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 someone just called out the Hennessy Cornerstone Fund the other day. I mean, it's up huge uh, this year. They, of course, they have a huge holding of Supermicro and some of these others that are more like mid caps now. Uh, but yeah, I don't think small caps are 
particularly risky. Like I would rather own small cap uh, equities here than than sort of the large names that everybody's owned, right? I think like Nvidia, Microsoft, uh, Google, Apple, Tesla, et cetera, are kind of overowned at this point. They're not bad businesses. I'm not saying they can't continue to go up. I just for a new dollar, I would rather put it in something that that looks a little cheaper. Yeah, that's a good distinction to the new dollar. You know, the, the money you're putting to work now. Um, just as we wrap up, because believe it or not, we're out of time. Um, anything else in the stock world that's interesting to you? I know if you're if you've seen the returns um, as you have on what's happening with the Bitcoin, say it's 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 so much it's done so much better as you point out than the S and P. It's kind of hard. Um, but is there anything else that that's getting your attention or that you'd be considering? Um, for diversification reasons um, in yeah, the I mean, stock if, universe? Yeah, if, you're, if you have a barbell approach, um, the safer part of the equity spectrum still, I think right now, is like energy stocks, right? Like look at the MLPs uh, year to date, like Enterprise Product Partners and Energy Transfer and Western and some of these guys, like they're, they're doing great, even relative to the S&P with a much higher yield um, and more margin of safety, in my opinion. Um, healthcare, just in general, has just gotten so cheap um, for a while, it was like medical devices were really cheap. Biotech was really cheap. Um, now, like even the 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 kind of stalwarts like United Healthcare uh, have kind of been beat up a bit. Um, so I think like if you want to fish for value, and you want to kind of diversify and, and have something to counterweight like crypto or uh, you know more growthy risk, like you can put some energy in healthcare alongside uh, Bitcoin and, and AI, and all of a sudden I think you have like a really interesting portfolio. Fantastic stuff. Love the barbell. Mike, it's so great to have you on and catch up with you. A lot of fantastic information in there for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maggie. And thanks to all of you. Thanks for the great questions. Going to be the start of a very busy week. We'll have all of the coverage of all that inflation data coming at you all week long. So stay with us. Thanks, everybody. Take care and good luck out there.